Hello my soccer universe, Serie A review, we haven't done one in two weeks and that actually will be the last review for uh, this past weekend because we're leaving today so uh, there will not be much coming also if you, uh, I will very likely not be able to make a Champions League review on Thursday, uh, absolutely and I don't know how I will do with the European week whether I do something Friday evening or not in any case there will be a plenty of cool content that i've already shot uh, all jersey related coming up as well but let's go um serie a in the past two weeks i mean it was really uh, almost primed to have it this way because uh the previous round there was only one nominally big game that didn't really deliver but there were some interesting developments um Wearing Milan, two wins, cannot complain, uh, not always pretty, uh, those wins, but you know, six points more and uh, being back in second spot at the table, chasing the league leaders, Napoli up there, who um, had to fight hard one week and, then, yeah, and both weeks had to fight hard, but they prevail and you more and more get the sense that Napoli are the real deal. Especially on the last weekend, we had a bunch of crazy games. I mean, the craziest to me was definitely Inter's win at Fiorentina. That, you know, it may as well have ended in a 3-3 draw. That this went then so crazy is just... Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, and yeah, also Udine, uh, who have been praising, 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 praising over the past few... Uh, weeks they only picked up one point and also Atalanta coming unstuck a little bit while uh, the Eagle again rising Lazio despite not having Immobile who is out injured getting a big win at Atalanta so yeah and lastly you see Juventus way up there which is unusual but they got two wins in a row is also something we haven't seen a whole lot jump into the previous weekend so weekend uh mid-october weekend um where the first big one was of course the Turin derby and at that point you were down and out literally they just had been wiped uh in uh, haifa uh everyone looked at their performance and said they are really really bad and everyone said this is now the one derby the one time that torino Probably has a chance to have a home game. They are nasty side to play against against a Juve side that has no confidence. Well, seemingly for the Derby, Juve can pick it up a little bit, or Torino just fell flat. Maybe it's the lights that were uh, sadly on them. I mean, my first thought was losing to this Juventus side. If you're a Torino fan, you might as well pack it in. This was just uh, exactly not what you wanted. And uh, I actually have, I, at, the, at least at the beginning of the season, I had some high hopes for this Torino side uh, to maybe, you know, get, if not challenge, challenge maybe for a conference league spot because they did some uh, interesting stuff. No, I think that Juve even deserved that win uh, squarely. Uh, the, I think probably, probably, probably the, uh, the best game from uh, the, the uh, teams that they were in there was uh, surely Atalanta against Sassuolo, but... Atalanta actually really wiped the floor in the first half with Sassolo, who took the lead through uh, the first chance. But uh, Kyriakopoulos, uh, but Pasalic uh, right before uh, the half gets an equal and right after the half, uh, Lukman makes it 2-1 and then uh, Atalanta see out a very deserved win. Inter were always going to win at home to Salernitana and the two best players of Inter over the last uh, few weeks are scoring in Lautaro Martinez and Nicolo Barella. Uh, both of them are in great form and if Inter have any hope of getting back into a title race, I bank my hopes on these two, not so much on Lukaku because I actually have, have a feeling that, and I might be now completely wrong, but I have a feeling that Inter works actually quite well in they don't necessarily need a Lukaku up front, but you know, what do I know? Uh, Lazio uh, in the top clash against Udine, uh, nil nil. Uh, then at the same time, we had Napoli against Bologna. That was a tight, tight game. And you know, as a Milan fan, I am now looking a little bit, you know, because I want to uh, uh, look at first spot, always looking for Napoli to drop me, me points. And it was kind of there. I mean, the one thing I have to say, Napoli is not only super entertaining to watch, they in the cha in Champions League, they have been really amazing overall. Um, but um, in the league, maybe they let it slide a little bit too, too much, you know, also uh, a little bit of load management. 
They went down through a goal by Sixi. I think that's the guy that was in Bayern by Juan Jesus uh, before they have equalizes and Irving Lozano gives them a 2-1 lead in the 49th. And But Bologna really dug, dug in, uh, worked very hard, getting equalizers through Musa Bero. However, uh, it's Victor Osimen. It's not the first time that we'll talk about this guy uh, to do in this video. Who gets in the win uh, after Quara assist? And as much as we talk about Quara, uh, Quara Chkelia, uh, I think the true star of Napoli is Victor Osimen. They can play well without him. They have proven that. But he provides this cherry up top, uh, a player that I think will only grow from here on out and it's a 3-2 win which actually put in some pressure on Milan in Verona and Verona yes uh, there was a famous uh, win la at the end of last season where they won through Tonali um, it you know after the kind of Champions League disappointment uh, injuries and all that kind of stuff you were really looking at uh, can uh, can Milan bounce back I did not go with high hopes in there because I know Verona are uh, not easy to play and while Leao had his typical runs the teams basically trade on goals in the first 20 minutes uh, Veloso I mean it was a Leao run that he pulled for Pupuzin and then how the um, this was not called as an on goal uh, from Gabia, uh, the Gunter call, because it was clearly, it was deflected. Maybe the shot would have gone on, on goal, but to me it seemed like an on goal. And then it was kind of, uh, if I remember now co uh, correctly, that uh, while Milan, I think, tried to establish control on, on the game, Verona were really threatening and really asked some serious questions and it then really needed uh, changes at the halftime. Uh, Brian Diaz, who was in, ineffective, um, and Olivier Giroud, who is just overplayed. I mean, uh, as great of a player as he is at this moment, he's very much overplayed. So Origi coming on was definitely helping. And then um, I thought that Adli did also not look that good. Uh, so, you know, bringing Benacea brings a little bit more stability, Pobega. And then once these four players were in place, I really felt that the Milan had control of the game. And uh, needed to get and could get the winner through Tonali uh, after Rebic assist again. Tonali, <sighs> it was not that simple, it really was not that that's it because uh, Tio came on uh, for Leao to kind of shore up the defense. Which honestly, I hate this tactic because it just means you hang back and you invite pressure. And he had to make a big save uh, right after coming in. And then Milan had to hang on. But in the end, they got the win. It was not convincing, but a win nonetheless. Not convincing is also how we can describe Roma's 1-0 at Sampdoria with a Pellegrini penalty. Um, Sampdoria, as I said, is a team that I'm very, very worried about. And Fiorentina only won one at Lecce. Uh, Fiorentina is a team that's a little bit crazy. It reminds me a, a little bit of a Sampoli team. They are capable of great things but they can also implode at any moment and of course that will happen next time when we talk about them um midweek i think there were some coppa italia fixtures however not for the big guys so um holding my horses there uh juve come back you know also preparing for the champions league because now they have the big clash at benfica where every they need a win it's as simple as, as that and they got another win, 4-0 over Empoli. It was not much hard work, but Rabio actually turns out to be a decent player for once, scoring two goals, uh, Kostic and Ken uh, connecting, also McKenny. So, you know, maybe, maybe, just maybe there might be something. Um, of course, I'm going to talk also about Milan's 4-1 win over Monza, where I had a similar thing, but here I had kind of... You know, Monza is run by Galliano and uh, Berlusconi, who, of course, built the great Milan team, uh, the great Milan, Milan teams of the, of the 90s and the 2000s. So in that sense, a um, lot of good feelings all, all around it. And I was not sure, will Monza now uh, push Milan or will they just a little bit more roll over? 
think it felt a little bit more on the other side. I don't know. I mean, if I looked at the Milan lineup, this was probably the weirdest lineup that I have seen for Milan uh, in, in Lanka with, with uh, many uh, starting that you wouldn't expect. You know, uh, you had Origi getting his first start. You had a front line of Rebic, Diaz and Messias behind. Pobega and Benacer. Um, Kier come, come, come in, which is probably, probably not good. Uh, Serginio Des getting a start. So it's not the strongest team. There were the... Um, uh, there was, for instance, no Rafa Leal because he needed to get some rest because of the big Champions League game coming up. However, in the end, it didn't matter because Brahim Diaz, uh, first assist by Tata Rujano, makes it 1-0. And this was one of those goals where he just doesn't give up to make it 1-0. He literally just uh, he gets the ball at the midfield line, runs down, uh, wiggles himself through, then he's even brought down. And then uh, while falling, pushes the ball past uh, the keeper, 1-0. Really, really nice goal. The second one also, I see by Origi, also really nice. The turn he makes and puts it in for the first minute and that uh, there was tight. In between, there was a good header for Monza. But other than that, I think Milan is well in control. Of course, they played in the ugly third jerseys, however... That makes me different. at Verona they played in the white ones and now they played in the dark green ones so I think this is kind of an in-between that's why I'm wearing this jersey for this video the game was done at 2-0 Monza were not gonna come, come, come back uh, the question was not only how big will the score have been Origi gets a brilliant goal back but seemingly he injured him, him himself uh, at, at, at the same time Leao at Minwell had come come on also the Ketelare and Kalulu you know uh, changing things a little bit up uh, Monza got a little bit back in, into the game when a Ranocchio free kick went in and then a second one was kind of um, challenging but then when Rafa makes it 4-1 then the game was really, really done. So uh, he also gets, gets and the Ketelare should have gotten on there as well and left then uh, the pitch rather disappointed. Give that boy time. Tonali was not great in the first season. Give the Ketelare some time. Yes, he cost a lot of money. Give him time. He is an investment for the future. As long as Brahim shows up, I still think start the Ketelare uh, in general. And then get bring Brahim on as a uh, super sub. I think that should be uh, the strategy going forward. Then in the evening, uh, one of the maddest games of the season. I mean, uh, it looked like after 50 minutes there will be no contest. And I even thought at that point, do I really want to watch, watch the game? But, um, you know, I was doing a few things. And then I see uh, that Di Marco brings down a Fiorentina player. It's a penalty, but it's not a red card or a yellow card or, or, or whatever. I mean, the penalty, yes, okay. But when you see the foul, <laughs> should have been a little bit more. I, I really think, and many even said that uh, it, should, it should have been a red card. Cabral puts it back. Okay, game on. I keep watching, and boy, did I not regret that. And I decided to only watch that particular game. Uh, Ikone. gets an equalizer for Fiorentina. Fiorentina are pressing forward. And I... As, I mean, both teams really offensively played great. However, the chaos at the back was not the great, greatest one. And just in this pressure phase, um, Inter get a penalty, justifiably so. And Lautaro Martinez uh, converts that one. It's 3-2. Desperation with Fiorentina. Um, however, Luka Jovic in the 90th minute brilliantly scores a goal. Uh, the, uh, absolutely wonderful goal. Again, I'm thinking... Okay, see that game out, see the game out, 3-3 three, three is good. Yes, of course I want you to win. And just when you thought that the game is over, it's a count counter deck where, um, I don't know, was, was Barella running down? Uh, then on the left side, there's Gosens uh, running the cross, calm, calms in. And I think it's Bellanova who wants to clear it and place it right into Mkhitaryan, who puts it in the empty net. What a crazy finish. This this game was absolute madness because it had everything. You thought it was done. Fiorentina come back. Peg, peg it back. Uh, you think that Inter might fold now. No, they did not fold under, under, under pressure because they take the lead again. Invite again the pressure. Uh, everything is thrown at them. Jovic gets a brilliant, brilliant equalizer. And then you implode and Inter come out for three winners, which is a Pretty big win for them to get a little bit back on track again. I don't understand Torino. 
you just lost the derby against Juve and then you win at Udinese where hardly anyone has ever won this season. Uh, this is something I do not understand Torino at all. Uh, Bologna getting another win as well. Um, Lazio relatively efficient and without Immobile getting a 2-0 win that was fully deserved. Zakanje and Felipe Anderson scoring, scoring, scoring their goals. Might it be that they play better without Immobile? I don't know. Uh, I I've, I wouldn't go as far yet, but it was really, really uh, a, a, a game where Lazio showed, yeah, we might be really good. Maybe we finally get the Sari, uh, uh, the hang of what Sari wants us to do. And that is actually pretty exciting. Um, excitement. It was on the stands, but I have to say the Roma-Napoli game over was rather flat. It was, you know, Roma playing uh, Mourinho style, keeping it tight uh, at the back. Uh, Napoli maybe having a little bit more of the game, but it was not this free-flowing attack that we know from the Champions League because uh, it was both teams were fighting really, really, really hard and nullified themselves most of the time. There was a penalty shout. Uh, but um, Rui Patricio got to the ball first, so I think it was fine that this was not given as a penalty. Uh, not too many chances either way. Um, I think that a fully fit Zaniolo before his knee injuries might have done some damage. I think he had a really, really good game over overall, worked his ass off. Uh, but it was, it was a stale game. It was not a fun game to watch, to be honest. However, when you see the goal, the winning goal by Victor Osimen, that was all worth it. The through ball from Politano, where uh, Smalling has the better position. However, uh, Osimen stays in there, has all the physicality, kind of bullies himself into the ball, but then is put out in a really weird outside pull position and just volleys it in. From a very, very strange angle, a uh, great piece of skill to get that goal in. It was absolutely a brilliant goal and uh, Roma could not come back from that one. Despite then uh, throwing on Matic, Vinja, Sharavi, Shomurodov. Shomurodov. Honestly, uh, in that form... Napoli are absolutely for real. Uh, I think at this moment you have to consider them uh, the biggest title. Uh, the, uh, you have to consider them title favorites. But you know, they have done that before. So I'm always careful to make big statements pronouncing them as already Serie A champions. That's not going to happen because the season is still going very, very long. Yesterday, Sampdoria get a vital win at Cremonese and then Sassuolo beat Hellas Verona and Hellas not looking good at all this season. Despite them being, uh, I, th I still think that they're a hard team to play, I play against, but now uh, they're not getting the results and I think there might be change of foot coming soon. At the moment, Napoli, 60% favorites, three points clear, Milan and Lazio behind Atalanta and Roma dropping out because uh, of their losses. Um, I think that Lazio of those is actually uh, very intriguing uh, because, you know, this is not a team that you had on the radar. So we, we got to see Inter at the moment in seventh place, you, you were in eighth, but I think they will eventually overtake Udine uh, for, for sure. I think Inter will probably have a, a relatively easy top four finish. Not so sure about Juventus at this point, to be honest. On the bottom, Sampdoria, Hellas and Cremonese. Yep, and Legend, Spezia, Monza also in there. Then dangerously Fiorentina and Bologna. Watch this space. I mean, Fior Fiorentina is kind of a little bit of a nutcase of a team at this moment. Uh, better to look again at the expected standings. Again, Napoli, Milan, Inter sounds about right this at this moment. Uh, Roma now in the top four, Lazio still in top six, uh, but it's, as you can see, it's very, 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 very tight and Juventus would only have a conference league spot. Um, I don't quite believe that. On the bottom, Sampdoria now move out of the relegation is Lecce, Spezia and Cremonese. Uh, I think we will have a very intriguing battle against relegation, honestly. I think there are quite a few teams that could get implicated. Because of the way the scheduling works now in the next two uh, weeks for me, I may wait until two weeks to do, do another Serie A review, although I don't like doing that. So here are the two um, sets of fixtures. Um, I think next week, I mean, Napoli and Sassuolo could be. Is there a challenge in there for Sassuolo? 
Inter should have no problem with some some some, some, some Toria. Uh, Milan at Torino. Ah, it's a dicey match, I would say, but I again would expect them to win. And then uh, I think we have again two Mon Monday games: uh, Hellas against Roma, Monza against Bologna. So gotta see. And then uh, first weekend of November, we have actually a pretty amazing fi fixture with three top clashes: Atalanta, Napoli. Despite the clouds that the other two on the bottom have, I think Atalanta and Napoli is probably the one that will tell us most about those two teams and who might win the championship. Because Atalanta, despite getting this loss to Lazio, is, uh, is a team that I think will challenge. Maybe not for, for the title, but for a top four spot. Uh, Milan against Spezia should be an easy win, but we have said that last time, 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 time around and the referee imploded. However, it's all about those last two fixtures. We have the Derby della Cap Capitale, it will be wild, and then we have the Derby d'Italia. I don't understand why we have to have both fixtures on the same day back to back. I really hate the scheduling there because I think each game on their own would deserve their own. I mean, I would put one of those on the previous weekend I think it would be much better but I guess after the Champions League is over it's probably better to have have have, have it this way but um, I found this rather curious in any case that's it from me from Serie A uh, this is weekend uh, please let, let me know if you want to add anything to what I said in this video uh, subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this give me a thumbs if you like this one and I will talk to you soon bye Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye!